Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hello and welcome. Once again, my name is Mikey Aaronworth, signing on to the sign-off. It's the podcast where we tell you everything you didn't know you wished you knew about the world of sports marketing. And the more I say that, the more I'm wondering, is that too much of a mouthful? Time will be the judge. But until then, we have a very special episode coming up for you next. But not special in the way that you might think. We don't have a fantastic third guest on, but what we do have is the focus on our second most popular host of this podcast. It is my dad, Brian Aaronworth, the president of Frameworth. And our major focus of this episode is actually going to be on autographs and how it started off as the Wild West of the industry. No one really knew where to go to get an authentic autograph. And if you wanted to be in this game, you really had to learn who you could trust or go and do it yourself. And that's the story that my dad is going to be taking us through. Uh, Listen, I'll take any chance I can get to sit down with my dad and have him tell me some of the stories of the earlier days of this industry. He doesn't give me a lot of time to sit down and talk with him. He's a busy man. Instead, live vicariously through me for the next 45 minutes or so. I promise you, you're not going to want to miss some of these stories. I learned actually quite a bit, even though I was working for the company at the time, there was way more going on behind the scenes than I was even aware of. And uh, he's here to share that all with you. So without further ado, I'm going to let us go into the next portion of the episode and we will see you guys on the other side. We started rock and roll was in the 1950s. By the time we get started, it'll be in the 1980s. <laughs> okay. All right. Enough of your guff. All right. <clears throat> And welcome back to the sign-off. Uh, you'll notice uh, by our beautiful faces, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, that it's the two of us, the two founders of the sign-off podcast here once again. The last time we had a chance to sit down with just the two of us, as uh, Will Smith once famously stole, uh, it was on episode two. And now we're here, episode five. Feels like it's only been five weeks, doesn't it, Dad? <laughs> Feels a lot longer with sitting across from you. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. You know what? We're developing our personalities and this is okay. Obviously, we've had some fantastic guests on the show. Daryl Sittler to start us off. Ken Reed uh, last week. Once again, for those of you who were listening, uh, we apologize for the audio issues we had there. Uh, we've done a lot more double checks and triple checks in three years of recording I've never had that happen, but hey, look, we live and we learn, uh, and I'm here to live and learn with you, Dad, today, as you kind of walk us through the ins and outs of how you got started, specifically with signatures, is what we want to focus on. The name of the episode today is From Signature Chaser to Industry Changer, and I know you're going to love that because you would be the titular uh, industry changer in this, uh, in this, but before we get into that, uh, I do just want to kind of ask you, you know, it's been, it's been five weeks, a long five weeks, as you say. Uh, what what are your thoughts uh, lately? How have things been Actually, going? Actually, this has been a lot of fun for me. I uh, It's been miserable for me, so it's good to hear. <laughs> well, I've actually heard from a lot of people um, that have really uh, actually turned in, uh, tuned in, so that's great. We've got our friends. Really neat uh, story because uh, a long time ago, I got a call about three or four years ago from a good friend of mine, John McDermott, uh, and you'll know him from uh, from his great albums. And uh, used to be the uh, anthem singer for the Toronto yes, as well. Yes, And so I got to know John just because he had phoned me about um, putting him in touch with Sidney Crosby for something that he was doing for a charity. And then uh, we got to be friends. So at one point, John asked me if he could bring um, some friends from uh, Tignish PEI. PEI for the American listeners who may not know. Prince Edward Island. There you go. One of the prettiest places in the world. And, and you've uh, seen, I've been around the me world looking yeah, in the mirror. Yeah, I mean, this yeah, is <laughs> exactly so. Um, so we met in the uh, go figure. They're East Coasters. We met down in the Platinum Lounge at the Air Canada Center and uh, started with a few pops and ended up as uh, as the evening went on. Of course, we were all kind of uh, taking cabs home, so we we're okay. But we hit it <laughs> off. These guys, I could tell you, East Coasters are the salt of the earth. These yep. are the best people around. Anyways, we. We had a, a great evening. They came up to visit our showroom here, and we had photos, and it, w- it was like they were visiting the Hockey Hall of Fame. I was, I was so thrilled that they enjoyed themselves so much. We ended up, and I had never been to PEI, so we ended up going out there, uh, your mother and I, Lori, and, and we 
visited these people. What great hosts mm -hmm. picked us up in their car, drove us around, showed us everything. And they're, they're lobster fishermen. So that's another good contact. I have. <laughs> and this is before uh, not to cut you off, but this is sort of a testament to the types of people that you meet in this industry. Uh, sports just serves as this kind of melting pot for people from all over the place. And this is someone that you met on a whim and you've kept in touch with ever since this entire group, right? So become very good friends. Well, I got because of this podcast, I got another note from him on Facebook saying we really enjoyed the podcast and uh, we listen every week. So I just want to give him a shout out because, awesome. uh, they're such huge uh, Toronto Maple Leaf fans. And, of course, on the East Coast, they love their Boston as well, but Toronto fans. And they come down once a year. They're missing their trip this year. We miss them. We're going to get out to see them. They're going to come here. And it just shows how uh, widespread this fandom is, you know, whether it's, you know, these people out in Prince Edward Island who you'd think maybe you have nothing in common with being, you know, a city slicker from Toronto. And now all of a sudden you get to talking and you guys collect all the same things and you have uh, that sort of love language of sports to, to go. I actually, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, uh, we were reached out to by another listener to the podcast and uh, we told a story recently, I believe it was when we were with Rocket, the security yep. agents, uh, or, or head of security, uh, who uh, was telling, you know, stories about about keeping his his players safe and moving through lines and things like that and what to do when there's, there's fans around. And we told a story, you told a story that I wasn't too excited about telling, but <laughs> you and I, to, to summarize, if you haven't heard episode three with Rocket, uh, go back and listen. You and I were at uh, in Nashville at the All Star Game, right? And I was younger at the time, and you know I'm I'm six foot two, like you know I I, I figured Pretty young, well young built, enough. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking maybe maybe it would be cool if someone mistook me for an athlete because that's where I get my my uh, my my fun from is, is maybe I could pretend to be someone else. And you kind of laughed at that, whatever. And we're walking, uh, into the arena and immediately we just say, Hey, Hey, we hear these, these two fans screaming. And I'm like, fucking here it is. We got it. We got it <laughs> guys. I got, I got recognized and you just kind of chuckle. And as we're walking by, they say, aren't you Brian Aaronworth from Frameworth? <laughs> so they, so we got someone reaching out to us who actually told us that they were those people who pointed you out, and that's Patrick McManus. Patrick, and you know what? It's funny, because Patrick's a great customer of Frameworth. I had no idea. I don't even know that I would recognize him in the street. Yeah. Uh, but because of this podcast, and he goes to all the All-Star games, and I think him and his wife or girlfriend, I can't remember if, uh, which one, but he's, well, no, there's only one. <laughs> Sorry, there's only Gosh. one, but I can't remember Sorry, if he's Patrick. married. I think it's his wife. Okay. And they've been to, I think, all of the arenas, to see the Penguins play because they're awesome. big Penguins fans. That's awesome. But anyways, he said uh, uh, we decided that the next All-Star game that is happening that we can go to, you and I and Patrick and, Amazing. and his wife are going to get together for a drink or two and uh, and have some fun. I mean, that that is the fun of this podcast. And, and you know, it, it, it may feel a little bit on the nose that we start off this podcast talking about this podcast. But the reason why we want to kind of take a break and summarize this is just to say, you know, Frameworth as a company for so long, we're focused uh, more on the corporate sales, the corporate end of things. You know, we'd make deals with Labats and the teams and the players. But especially in the last year, you know, if COVID has done one thing that's really helped us out, it's it's brought us into contact with the 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 individual collectors on right. much more of a one-to-one -one basis and this podcast is now another opportunity for us to reach out and get to know our supporters uh, a lot more intimately which is one of the things I really love if there's something positive came out of of this COVID for our company anyway is the fact that uh, we used to deal through, as you mentioned, corporations, et cetera, et cetera, never really getting to know individual collectors. Well, now it's done a 180 swing. And right. virtually all the business we're doing right now is with collectors. And it's fun to talk to them, to meet them, to see what they like and what they don't like. And we talk about, uh, I've been in touch with all the Facebook people uh, or a lot of Facebook groups and another great group uh, that, is um, obviously very near and dear to Frameworth is um, Matt Ellenberger's group, the uh, Sidney Crosby memorabilia collectors uh, group. And they specialize virtually and they're real serious collectors. So if you want to know something about Sidney Crosby and his memorabilia, uh, check out that Facebook page because Matt's got, I don't know, there's four or 500 members there. But uh, they know everything. You want to know what something's worth. You want to yeah. know where it came from. And so we ran a little contest with them. And um, 
their their whole group is uh, listening to the to the podcast as well. Awesome. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, we'd love to serve as sort of that node that connects interested people to, to you know, ways in which they can interact with the community. And part of that is on Facebook and those groups. So, so again, right. shout out to them. Now, uh, you mentioned this group and they're heavily focused on autographs and signatures, in particular for Sidney Crosby. Now, Sidney Crosby has become, in a way, especially in the worlds of sports, mar- uh, sports memorabilia, synonymous with Frameworth and vice versa, Frameworth with Sidney Crosby. We've been working with him from the very beginning, from day one, since right. his days in, in removal. And I mentioned at the top of the show that the name of this episode is going to be From Signature Chaser to Industry Changer. And the reason why that's the name of the show is because Frameworth started out in this world of sports marketing as a company that would source autographs through people who already got them. You know, there was a... a, a place or person or people to whom you would go in order to find these autographs, then we would resell them based on uh, what we got to the end user after we, you know, put them in a frame or, or did something along those lines. And it wasn't until relatively recently in the, in the brand, the, the broad scope of Frameworth that we decided to work with the athletes directly, the athletes, the agents, and the teams. And I kind of want to bring us through that process because I was involved in a lot of it, but I actually don't know the the full story. Um, and I the, the one thing that I do know is that a lot of what happened was very, word of the day, fortuitous, fortuitous because we made some decisions. And when uh, when it came down to it, we really lucked out. We bought Google at 15 cents, essentially. And and things happened in a way that allowed us to kind of expand and take some more risks. And at a certain point, it bit us and we had to recover from it. So that entire arc is what I want to take the listener on, on this journey. So why don't you start us off? Why don't you tell us about the early days? Frameworth is just getting into the world of sports marketing and sports memorabilia. And you need to, and you, you've recognized similar to when we had that, uh, the piece with the Blue Jays that was signed, that there is absolutely a market for signed items. And now you take it upon yourself to figure out how to improve upon that. Right, right. When, and also, before I just get into that, the one thing I would say, when I talk about fortuitous, um, things happen for a reason. And you know my philosophy in life. Put yourself in the right place and good things will happen. And that's basically what's happened. That, that's, a, that's a funny way of you saying, uh, when you're talking to famous people on the phone, say their names out loud very, very often and hope the people around you hear Somebody's going to hear you. Someone's going to hear it. So... In the early stages when we realized that autographs sell picture framing, which is what we were doing at the time, um, we didn't have any contacts to speak of. Uh, we, you know, we knew of some players and we we did some picture framing for some players, but very few. Um, in those days, you there were guys that did kind of hounds that brokered these things. It wasn't a really organized uh community right. where it is uh, similar to what it is today. It was very different. It was guys that would uh, know the odd player, ask them for autographs, pay them a little money on the side or whatever it would be, and then go around and sell them. There were car shows and things like that. And, and they try and move those autographs. When we realized that they autographs help sell frames, we would search those people down or they would come to us and say, Hey, you know, do you want to buy some Doug Gilmore autographs or some, any of the leaves particular. How much, how much at this point in time, because, you know, it, it sounds like what you're describing is kind of like the Wild West. It you was. know, there, there are people popping up anywhere. How did you know who to trust at these times? You don't have to name names. No, um, to be honest with you, that's the big dilemma. Right. And that's why we started making a move in, in a different direction. We Because you wanted to help fix that, right? As well, a, exactly. I mean, how do, unless we're at the autograph signing. Right. And... We had to trust the fact that they were real. And building a business, well, we're in our infancy, so it wasn't as big a deal. Um, You want to make sure that what you're selling is authentic. And since we didn't appear there, we had to trust the people, which is very unnerving. Um, We did kind of check out their backgrounds and know that this guy was a friend of Doug Gilmore's or that guy was a stick boy at the you know, mm-hmm. or equipment manager, and he would No, I think they prefer them. stick boy these days. Yeah. I think that's the correct term. <laughs> so we, we could trust some of them, but who knows? So right. it wasn't long before we realized that our reputation would be on the line if we were buying autographs that weren't authentic. Did you ever find yourself in a situation where you found out that you had purchased 
improper autographs or no? I'm trying to think. I I don't think so. Yeah. I, if if we felt that there was any reason that they they might not be authentic, then we wouldn't sell fair, them. Fair, fair. Right. So we've we've run into things. I would never buy from a card show from a vendor sitting at a at a booth. And in fact, even today, um, you know, there's a lot of trust that goes into these companies, and we can get into that in another show, like PSA and JSA sure, and sure. all that. But I'm not sure. I mean, it's great that there's some source there, but I'm not sure what their real qualifications are for gauging. So I, I have a hard time believing that even with a PSA or JSA autograph on or a certificate on it, that that I would trust it 100 percent. I mean, it's only an opinion. Um, and of course, that's the same with Frameworth. You got to hope that we are not doing Fair. anything, or or Fanatics or Upper Deck is not doing un- anything untowards. And we're moving in that direction to try and uh, fix that and find better ways to make sure that you can trust the authentication. And we got into NF, uh, NFTs, NFTs, and yeah. things, and we'll get it. Go yeah, I, I mean, to be fair to PSA, JSA, I mean, and those are companies that are trusted throughout the industry, yeah. and they're doing what they can with what you know, us in the industry, we call hotel autographs. It's very hard to determine with 100% certainty what is and is not an autograph when what we wanted to bring to the table or you wanted to bring to the table when you decided to get, uh, and we'll get into this, some exclusive arrangements with some of the the athletes was a consistent autograph that was always recognizable regardless of what it was on. The problem with a hotel autograph, uh, to, to kind of expand upon that, that's if you're you know waiting outside a hotel or an arena, just something that's signed on the street, is that it does have a little bit of inconsistency. So to your point, it's very hard for someone to look at it and say this thing that was you know maybe just scribbled on a little bit is or is not from a certain player. But you know with us not being on the ground there, it, it's hard to say whether they're guessing. I don't think they are. I think they have legitimate experts there, and this is not a shot at them whatsoever. I think it's it's always just wise to keep in mind that the best option you have is to go to a first party company like, you know, even like Upper Deck, yep. Fanatics. There, there are a lot of these companies that will do their own signings and ensure that they're there and then they give the authentic authentication as opposed to finding something that exists and then after the fact saying, yes, this is or isn't real. There's no question that there are more uh, reputable companies than others, okay? So, um, you know... If the best way to do it is to see it being done. Right. Um, but the second best way to do it is to make sure that you know that the source is is a legitimate source. Yeah. So Upper Deck represents Wayne Gretzky and um, Michael Woods, Jordan, Tiger Michael Woods, Jordan, and all, yeah, LeBron James, a lot of the I big, believe, yeah. big name guys. Um, and then there's Fanatics who have a number of players as well. I think they have Matthews and a couple of other guys couple of other guys. <laughs> and then Frameworth, who has, you know, uh, Sidney Crosby and Carey Price sure. and whatever. So if you've got those certificates related to the players and the and the source, you're pretty comfortable that it's authentic. You should be comfortable with it. Um, now, now, that's that's sort of an over, like an understanding of the industry. But right. I do, I want to walk through the actual process that got us here. Right. You know, we, yes. Because we started at the Wild West and now we're talking about legitimate places you can go, like a bank, you know, walk in and know that what you're getting is real money. Right. Now, the, your first step, you know, you've been dealing with these companies or, or individuals even who have popped up on the recommendation of players or as, as you so famously called them, stick boys, um, <laughs> to see whether or not you can get some autographs. What steps did you take? And and what was your initiative to try to fix that? Well, the first thing was I was uncomfortable as as the business grew, buying that many autographs, and our company was growing and getting a better reputation, and I didn't want to risk uh, the, our reputation by by taking a chance and buying something. That so this wasn't was 100%. this was always a fear at the time. Oh, from day one. Yeah, you know. So the next step would be to say, well, look, I realized at one point that we were buying. 80% of the autographs from the guy that was sourcing them right. for us. So right. I'm thinking, well, let's try and make some contacts with some players directly. Um, Doug, Gil- Doug Gilmore was one of the first ones that we approached, and I met him. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. I guess we met him through a fellow named uh, Steve Davies. Okay. And it was a thrill because Doug was, like, so hot in the industry. Yeah. He was he – was, the savior for the Leafs. And Steve was a guy that just came to me to do some framing. Mm -hmm. And 
then he was best friends with Dougie. So at one point he said, I want to Doug, uh, he was with Hespler hockey sticks or he owned Hespler hockey sticks. And he said, what if we got these? Could Steve you? did. Steve did. Okay. And Steve said, well, can you market these for me? And I said, yeah, that's great. He introduced me to Doug, which was a thrill. When you I, say these, as in like hockey, like signed hockey sticks? Signed Hespler oh, hockey amazing. sticks. That's what amazing. Doug used to with those okay. wooden sticks. Yep. So I met Doug. I remember bringing about 30 or 40 sticks to the, um, to the pub uh, behind Un- University of Toronto there. Um, what's the name of the street? Anyway, I can't think of the name off the top of my head. But we sat in that pub and drank beer all afternoon hey, and go. signed hockey sticks. But that's the first time I... So now we have the contact with Doug, which led to other contacts. And the more we did that, the more we didn't need these other guys. And uh, one thing led to another, and people just started to uh, realize that they should come to us if they wanted to sell their autographs sure. directly. And then from there, I mean, so this is kind of just case by case basis, right? Right. So you're you meet someone in Stephen who has a contact with Doug, and you say, "Let's let's do it." Stephen and Doug, by the way, if you don't have their last names, those just sound like very off the street names. Yeah. Turns out they're very high profile people. Uh, from there, though, you start to expand, I believe, right? I mean, what what brings you from sourcing out not not agents, just people on the street who have contacts with the players. How do you then expand? How do you then increase your roster size of people you can go to to get autographs? Well, word gets out that you're buying a lot of autographs right. and that you, and, and by this time we're starting to get associations with the NHL and the Players Association and getting licenses. So, so would you have had licenses at the time where you were buying the autographs? Not right at the beginning. So the frames would have been fairly simplistic then, you know, just just a, a framed image. We were doing what everybody else was doing, was taking a nice image and framing it up. Well, we were actually leading in that department of doing things. People kind of ended up following our lead on that. But as time went on, we had the licensing our reputation grew as a legitimate company that had all the licenses, paid all the royalties, et cetera. So that had people coming to us. Right. But the, the, well, I guess the biggest thing that happened once we started buying a lot was, was being approached by a, a, an agent who is a golf agent. Okay. The golf agent uh, was Dan Cimarroni. Okay. A and name I, that I, th- I feel like a lot of our listeners will know. He's a yeah. chefy and uh, he came to me, um, he knew of our company, did some framing here. We were doing Maple Leaf Gardens framing and the Leafs framing and the Raptors framing by that time. Was he, would he have been independent at this point or was he with a larger? He was with IMG. He was with IMG, which yeah. uh, uh, w- w- currently CAA, CAA bought up IMG, I believe. Uh, IMG Hockey. IMG, IMG Hockey. still exists right, right, right. Uh, as a, a major uh, entity. But uh, Dan came into the office, set up an appointment, and said, uh, I remember him sitting in my office. This was 19, or sorry, the biggest thing, 2003. And he said to me, uh, Brian, I've, I represent a golfer, a uh, Canadian golfer. He's a nice guy, mm-hmm. and he's, you know, he's up and coming. He's our top Canadian golfer. Being a golfer myself, I kind of knew who he was talking about. He says, just won a tournament out, e- out west in the Vancouver. Uh, his first major win, I believe. Um, I said, well, you're talking about Mike Weir. And he said, yeah, yeah, he's my client. And I said, well, that's great. Um, we don't really do much in golf and Mike was good. He was like our top guy, but yeah. didn't had you know, I didn't know whether I could market Mike. Right. Especially, you know, being so focused on hockey. Right. It's not, it's not like your clients who like hockey are necessarily going to be interested right. in it, it, golf. Don't, don't get me wrong. Mike was a, an up and coming big name, but we didn't do anything in golf. Right. So I said to him, you know what? I can try. Um, we'll do a, a deal. Uh, I want an exclusive deal if I'm going to put the effort into it. And he said, yeah, that's fine. He sure. said, you're, you're the company we want to deal with. You've got a great reputation. So we, we did a handshake deal. Before we go on there, you mentioned exclusivity, uh, right. which, is, which is something maybe we take a little bit of a break and explain that. That was a new idea yeah. at the time. Yeah. There was very few people that would do an exclusive deal with you. Doug would sign for me, but he would also sign at card shows and exactly. he would sign for AJ's or anybody else that was around. Now, a part of, you know, some listeners may hear that and think it's it's selfish. You know, you want a, a stranglehold on the market, but this relates back to what you're talking about, about autograph signings being the Wild West. 
if right. there is only one place you can get signatures, then there is only one company that can authenticate those signatures. So by striking a deal with an ex, uh, with an exclusive nature, you're kind of limiting the variables in whether or not an item is authentic. So you're you're increasing the value because it's like if you want it from the source, you have to go to the company with whom they're exclusive. Exactly. Well, it that solved that problem. Right. Um, but it also had another advantage, uh, or there was another reason for it, which is, look, we talk about Doug, um, sorry, uh, Mike Weir, and the fact that we didn't know what we could do with them. So I had to invest time, effort, right, right. Uh, you know, get some website designs for it and all that stuff. And if I'm going to do that, and then he's going to go with everybody else, then I didn't know whether I wanted to put the time and the effort in. Sure. Dan said, no, we're with you. We'll do an exclusive deal. We shook hands. He walked out and we started to prepare for Mike Weir. Two weeks later, I'm sitting there watching the Masters. <laughs> Mike Weir wins. <laughs> I was blown away. This was our one of the biggest things that ever happened to the company. First Canadian golfer to win the Masters. First left-hander to win the Masters. Um, he passed Phil Mickelson, mm -hmm. who had who was close many times before. And uh, we were just ecstatic. I, I was um, counting the dollars that we could make. <laughs> um, just by example, I think Mike, that following year, probably sold close to a million dollars worth of product wow. for us. And we weren't doing that much in business that time. So that was a major part of our business. Everybody, I got, the phone was ringing off the hook. We wanted autographed flags and autographed photos and anything we could get. Which was amazing. Yeah. Except that was in my head before we we had no contract. Oh, right. I had a shake handshake deal with Dan. Yep. Uh, and I'm on pins and needles, but I'm going along as if, hey, this is a deal. We had an agreement. I'm phoning Dan to see, you know, when we could do our first sign. Of course, Mike was inundated with things that he had to do right after the masters like what doesn't seem like you'd be that busy <laughs> uh. well i think he even played the following tournament i'm not sure but i know he was here in toronto dropping the puck at, at maple leaf yeah. gardens he was people forget maybe they do maybe they don't or, or maybe maybe they're center. yeah maybe they're maybe they're young but uh, are too young to have been through it but the canada was all about mike weir at this oh. point I mean, it was, me? it was like, you know, everyone in the world was into Tiger Woods when Tiger Woods was big. But when Mike Weir was big, people who did not care about golf watched golf. Every, well, he was Canada's hero at that point. You know what? We always joke about Canada having an inferiority complex about their athletes, that they're, they're not as good or they, you know, they, well, going back in my era, right. it, was like, it was like the NFL versus the CFL mm -hmm. and they don't compare and all that stuff. So when, when a Canadian athlete rose to, to, to the top of the sports world worldwide. It's in such an international was, sport. Like with, when the Blue Jays won and all that. Right. It's just, it was a different feeling. So now uh, two weeks go by. I'm trying to get this signing done. I get a phone call from Dan says, you got to meet us down at IMG. And I thought, uh -oh. oh, shit, here we go. Yeah. Handshake deal. They're going to walk from the deal. I was just devastated. They want to meet with me at their offices yeah. at Bluer and Young. So I prepare this product line to bring down to impress them. We framed up pictures without autographs at our expense, even though, you know, we didn't have, we just gathered pictures and showed sure. them how impressive our line could be. Bring them all down there. And I sit in the boardroom. There's about four or five big agents in there. And now Mike's got everybody's attention, even at IMG. Yeah. And I'm sitting with them in the group, and uh, I'm waiting for them to give me the bad news. And I said, you know, guys, this is the line. They, they were very impressed. They said, well, uh, you know, how are we going to do this? I said, well, we still okay? I said, of course we're okay. We gave you a handshake deal, and we're going to honor that. But the reason they called me down there was they felt that the deal should be a different structure because it's so much bigger. Right, right, right. And that's where we came up with the idea that we would only sell the products as a framed item. We wouldn't sell autographed photos and, you know, odds and ends sure. that people could junk up by putting them in their own collection. They wanted a standard set for the look and feel of the wall decor. So if you if you wanted a signed master's flag, you had to get the standardized style right. of a master's flag. That you weren't going to put it in a cheap black frame and right. whatever. Right. So 
it they wanted a certain uh, standard set. That was one thing, and they wanted without going into the details of the uh, of the contract, they wanted it more structured as a partnership as opposed to me buying autographs sure, one sure. at a time, yeah. which was fine with me. Uh, partnering with Mike Weir at the time was amazing. And knowing that the agency has an interest in, you know, the aesthetic consistency of their pieces, you know, to keep a, a certain look and feel, that's always a good thing. You want the person right. you're working with to be involved in that way. Right. So that was amazing and as i said from that time through the next year we had sold close to a million dollars worth of that product what was more important that came out of that meeting mr fortuitous <laughs> as i was getting up to leave um there was a fellow in that meeting his name was pat brisson mm. little uh, little nay i don't know if anyone's heard of him before well, pat at the time no not at the time but now pat was you know an up-and-coming agent yeah um Many of you will know that he's one of the leading agents in the business right now. One of the most powerful human beings. I think in he's the number right one now. on the power list of agents. He'd be number one, I think. Yeah. And and JP Barry, I believe, was there, who is partner, and I and they work for IMG as well, out mm -hmm. of Toronto. And so, as I'm getting up to leave, I remember Pat saying to me, he "says Brian, he says um, I'm here. It's, I have a hockey player that um, I'd like." you to consider and I said well who is that and he said the name Sidney Crosby mm. and I went well, that's interesting um I honestly didn't know that much about Sidney I heard about him a little bit as some phenom that's coming up and playing uh, sure. uh amazing hockey and uh I said well you know what I said uh what's it take and he said well he said, uh, we're looking for a $50,000 minimum guarantee. For a, at the time, 14-year-old kid? I don't even give $50,000 guarantees to most of the current yeah. players. Yeah, Okay, and that's what we would have to buy in one year. For a kid just leaving Shattuck St. Mary yeah. and moving to Ramuski, he wasn't even going to the NHL. No, we still had years left. And I don't really know much about this guy. But I do know what Mike Weir is worth to me. Sure. <laughs> and Mike Weir was, was going to be our big golden calf. Yeah. So I was afraid to say no. I thought if I didn't say yes to Sydney, then they might pull the Mike Weir deal. Oh, see, that's an element I had not heard. So you part of the reason why you did it is because you maybe not felt that they were pressuring you, but but you may have inferred that... I didn't have 50000 to do it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean... If they sold, if my, I knew if Mike Weir sold, then I'd have the, sure. the money to guarantee, even if I had to waste it or, right, right, or right, lose right, it. Right. So, which would you, you know, looking back, was it a waste? Uh, no, we did okay. You did okay. Okay. We did okay. I'm just, just checking. Just checking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I remember leaving the meeting thinking, I better do some homework on this Sidney Crosby kid. <laughs> um, Mike Weir did really well for us. Thank you, Mike, for for helping us take it to another and level. And Craig, his brother, we've we've worked with uh, you know, for forever. Craig yeah. and and uh, they get, that got into the winery business. That's a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. But so as I left, I was really excited about Mike Weir, and I knew I had to learn a little bit more about Sidney Crosby because I just made a big commitment. Sure. I didn't even have to make that commitment to Mike. Yeah. Mike was going to sell regardless. Yeah. Um, so as we left, that was it. Sid, that was how we got Sidney Crosby. Uh, well, it wasn't a final deal. Pat had to, well, this is another interesting story uh -oh. I just thought about. <laughs> Pat had to get permission from Troy and Trina Crosby and run it by them, of yep. course. Sydney's parents, yeah. Um, and he had to kind of go to them on our behalf and say, I've got this great company, Frameworth. Uh, here's some of the work that they've done. They just represented Mike Weir, et cetera. But don't forget, there were people more knowledgeable than me about hockey at the time. Right. I, I'm pretty good, but more and uh they said that there were other people looking to get sydney uh under their umbrella okay um even knowing about that fifty thousand dollar guarantee so there were people who knew enough to know that he may be worth fifty thousand dollars at at i believe 14 13 or 14 uh he was 15 i think at the 15 time. at the time 15. okay so now we do this so i'm worried about this deal with mike but we now we got now it's not a slam dunk that I've got Sydney. It's just that I committed to it if they want us to right, do it. Right. 
Pat Brisson comes up to visit our operation here, which is fairly impressive. Um, we got about 35,000 square feet and a nice showroom and all that. Uh, and so he's doing his homework. And, I, and he mentioned that he wants to introduce me to the Crosbys, um, but there's some other people on, on the table. I didn't know anything about it. We ended up doing the deal with the Crosbys and um, worked out a nice contract. Again, a partnership type of arrangement, which is still in place today. But a little while longer, you remember the Heritage game, the first Heritage game, outdoor game yep. in Calgary? Yep. So I'm there. Um, at the time, I am working with, um, I'm working with uh, Mike Brown of WG Authentic and Wayne Gretzky had a company WG Authentic and I had done a little work with Mike um, trying to do his memorabilia for Wayne's company. Wayne did his own memorabilia right, at the time right. and his brother-in-law Mike Brown. Prior to Upper Deck, yeah. I'm trying to get these timelines straight. So we're at this, I think that was the same year, 2003. Um, I'm having breakfast with Mike in the uh, hotel, I think it was a Weston and all of a sudden, um, I get it. Uh, Mike gets a tap on the shoulder and I look up and it's Wayne. You guys mind if I have breakfast with you? Yeah. Sorry. This seat's taken, sir. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just the, 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 you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm really excited that Wayne wants to sit down and I had met him a couple of times and we were doing some work for Wayne at the time and getting rolling on that operation. Um, and during the course of the conversation at the breakfast table, Sydney's name came up and he said, uh, Wayne said something like, oh yeah, did we get that deal, Mike? Oh my God. So it turns out that the people that we were bidding against were was, your partners in was, was WG Authentic and Wayne Gretzky. Cause and I, I didn't know that at the time. Cause our relationship with them, a framework's relationship at the time was essentially we would handle all of their framing. Right. right, for for WG right. Authentic. Yeah, yeah so we, we were, were partners, and, and you were good friends with Mike Brown at the time. Right, yeah. Mike Mike and I became very good friends, and I'm still friends with his family. There's a, That's a whole other storyline there. But to, Quick, to tie in with Mike, yeah, yeah. Mike Weir, that was, uh, for Wayne, to, I didn't know what to say. I was, like, I didn't want to embarrass him. And I literally said to Wayne, I didn't know you were bidding. I swear I didn't know you were bidding oh. on him. Um <laughs> And he looked at me, he says, you got a really good find there. That's um, really good. He was very gracious about it. We, and I don't know why they came to Frameworth over Wayne Gretzky. At the time, I didn't. And then I found out later, they felt that Sidney should be going on his own path. They felt that if they went with Wayne Gretzky's company, that there would be too much comparison between Wayne and Sidney right, as right. a young kid. They didn't want him to have to live up to any standards, fair. et cetera. Fair. And so they thought they'd go with a young company that uh, was, you know, kind of separate from all that. And yeah. that was the reason. And kind of, you know, a, a family run company, a company that, that is sort of grassroots that has done a lot, you know, that it, it's a good, it, it is a, a good kind of boutique brand to attach your name to. And we're obviously more than grateful to have had the opportunity looking back that year, that first year, that $50,000 a year, Maker was did did you make money? Because I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around how we you were sell. very close. Keep in mind that a fifty thousand dollar guarantee, and I won't get into the crunch the numbers. It was just a big big number back in that right, the, you right. know two thousand three. Um, it was, you know, it was hard to, it was going to be hard. I mean, Sydney's in Ramuski. Yeah. Okay, he's not playing in the NHL. He's getting a lot of media attention. I mean, he's on TSN every other night, and they're showing highlights as this new phenom that's coming into the league. But how many times have we heard that over the years? Prior to that, remember a name called Alexander Degg Deg. yeah. in uh, Ottawa, who was supposed to be the next one. You know, how many times have you heard the, the next, next Wayne one, Gretzky? Right? Yeah. Um, Sydney's living up to that kind of reputation uh, without comparing it too closely to two different things. But... Um, you know, you hear it all the time, but uh, you, you don't experience it. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I, I was wondering, you know, this back in 2003 was not 2021, where the hockey market is is hot. It's very hot, and it's gone through its ups and downs. But 2003, NHL is hard enough to sell $50,000 worth of product. Now we're dealing with someone who's in the queue. 
You know, that, that he's not even made the NHL yet. So I was curious. I actually didn't know that you nearly broke even. That, that in and no, of itself. Well, was, you know, it took a lot of salesmanship. Um, you know, we reached out for, you know, that was part of our success is reaching out to people that uh, we felt that could move numbers. And it wasn't as much selling to individual mm-hmm. people out there. It was, I remember going to Avon and putting a program together where they sold a certain Sidney Crosby products in their Avon books. And I don't know if anybody knows what Avon is, but it was used to be a catalog door to door type of yep. sales thing. So we would sell 500 here. I did a deal with Canada bread. Um, that was, know, that just, was after he'd come into the NHL though. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So it was reaching out to people and you had to go find them and tell them that this is going to be the next great player and they should get on board early. And then we sold. So it was a lot of work. And really, it wasn't worthwhile. No, <laughs> yeah, it hasn't. Yeah, no, 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 no real, no real benefit. And it's paid some great dividends, and we've become very, very close friends over the years. Yeah, I mean, it, it really has, I think, provided uh, the company and yourself with with an insight into the sporting world because of how intimate uh, your relationship with you know the family and Sydney himself ha- had become. And it, it does, you know, like it or not, put you in a different tier when you're the exclusive representation of an elite player like Sidney Crosby's. Now, you've just had two, you know, windfalls essentially fall into your lap. Um, You must have been on a high thinking, I need to sign as many players as possible. So take me through the next couple years because if I'm I'm, uh, feeling immortal like you must have been at this point in time, I'm putting more money down. You know, you you, you buy in a hot market like that, right? Well, keep in mind that I'm, I'm an older guy, so I, I'm really trying to keep these timelines, and they cross over, and I'm sure. thinking one's before the other. But as the years went on, we started, well, of course, my relationship with Pat Brisson was, became very uh, a very tight relationship. CAA uh, bought out. he So he bought out IMG, I believe, him and J.P. Berry, and they took it to CAA, which is Creative Artists, which is one right. of the biggest talent agencies in the world. Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer. Uh, if, if you've Cruise. seen Entourage, right. Ari works for CAA, essentially, right. is right. what they're looking at. That's, yeah. So they're based out of L.A. They moved their operations to L.A. Um, and Pat trusted me because of how well we did with Sydney and how we represented him. Because, you know, don't forget, it's not just about selling autographs. It's about... Uh, maintaining the brand sure and they liked the way we did that and we were very close with the crosby's understanding what they wanted to how they wanted to present sydney and 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 sydney himself and we wanted to make sure we we maintained a a, a quality image yep pat liked that so basically as pat's business grew so did frameworth and every caa uh, uh athlete in in the hockey world anyways would automatically come to Frameworth. So following it up, I remember meeting Pat Kane for the first time at the All-Star, uh, at the awards dinner in right, Toronto. Right, uh, Being introduced when Pat brought Pat Kane, Pat Brisson brought Pat Kane in to meet Sidney Crosby. Um, he wasn't playing then, he was just about to be drafted. And he asked Sydney for to autograph his hockey card. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Little now, did he know a year or two later he'd be wow. the one in that position. And Pat uh, Pat Kane obviously is one of the best in the league. So uh, we got uh, Jonathan Taves, we got Pat Kane, we've got um, you name it. Any one of those clients, uh, Evgeny Malkin, right? All of the CA clients, which are some of the best uh, hockey players in the world. Um, came to Frameworth pretty much automatically because they liked our model. And it was a few consistent years of players living up to the hype. You know what right. I mean? Like, like the, we, we, there were no Alex Daggs in that, in no. that group, you know, whoever we are. So, so again, you're just win after win after win. Well, Pat had a pretty good eye for talent. I would imagine. Yeah. I would imagine he, he played with, I believe Luke Robitaille back in the, the NHL. I, or was friends with, they Luke. were very good friends. Yeah. And that's how Pat got into the, into Agencies. the agency business. Yeah. That's a whole other story. Right. Maybe, maybe we'll get Pat on here one time. That would be we're fantastic. Still pretty good friends. Um, so I, I, I would imagine then that you're still thinking double down. Did you find yourself in any situations where you had maybe bit off more than you could chew? I mean, were you thinking that you were King Midas at this point? Everything you touch turns to gold. Well, right. There were other companies that started following our model and, and trying to get players exclusively. Um, 
you know, local Toronto companies uh, tried to grab this guy and that guy. Mm-hmm. There was a guy in Detroit, uh, Hockey Inc. Hockey Inc., yeah. Uh, he had some of the Detroit Pascal players. Pascal Dupuis. He had, uh, I think, Ovechkin for a while as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, everybody was, everybody was following the model, trying to grab sure. whatever and do this exclusive thing. Uh, obviously, so now I'm sitting there. We're having a couple of super, super years. Right. And I'm thinking, well, why, why would I let anybody else do that? Let's just go for the. So I went to um, Newport, right, which is Donnie Meehan's company, and um, uh, I they had a lot. Of, so if you want to describe agencies, I would say is my personal thought is Pat Brisson was more of a boutique boutique. They're looking for not that many players, but top top notch. Um, Donnie was ahead of Pat, so he had lots of clients and, and they would take on great players and they would take on, uh, Wendell Clark was there sure. during the day and sure. all that. So they had a lot of great players. They would take on a lot of, uh, middle range players to take on basically right. anybody right. that was going to go into the NHL that I, as far as I was concerned, but well, they had a couple of great, they had a Ginla, they had a bunch of guys, they had, uh, Steven Stamkos coming yep. into the league. So I'm thinking, okay, there's a bunch of new guys coming in. There's about six or seven that were top notch. So I went to them. I got a call from them saying, hey, maybe we can work out a deal for all of our guys. I said, wow, this is great. So I went and did that deal. And, um, you know, I kind of. That a specific guarantee for every player. Guarantee for every player. Every player. And this, when you say every player, this isn't, you know, the four guys, Crosby, Taves, Kane, Malkin. This is. Well, 10 no, players, this is 12 ten, players. Yeah, 10 or 12 I, players. I remember I, I was working at the company at that time, and I was going off on signings almost every week. And I remember at one point just seeing a stack of papers on your desk, and it was each player's contract. And each of those contracts had w- attached to it a guarantee. Right. Now, eventually, you would imagine you kind of run low on uh, who you can sell to, how many uh, autographs you can sell. Did you find yourself in a situation where you you were having trouble keeping up? Well, I think I can I can admit that I f- I got too big for my britches. Uh, <laughs> I th- I thought I was way better than I was at marketing. I thought our company could do way more, but it turned out that we could not. You couldn't market all these guys right. as you know. It's not like they're all coming to you. The Sydney, the Sydney Crosby model. I mean, we had to work it, but you know, people would find us. It would sell itself. The product right. would sell itself. And then I had to go and do these signings, meet the players. I would go down to Tampa and sit with Steve uh, um, Stamkos, Stamkos, and and actually did one with Le Cavalier at the same time. And all these signings that we did, I was busy getting the signings done. Never mind marketing the product. So, um, so it. It just didn't work out. Right. And I couldn't keep up the pace. Well, not, it, not with the way you wanted to structure the company as well. It seems like you always had a vision of, you know, you mentioned CAA being the boutique company, you know, wanting to focus on fewer uh, people, fewer talent, and and really make sure they had a brand built around them. You can't do that when you have so many people. Right. Yeah. CAA was a much better fit for us, uh, you know, uh, Don me and put some faith into Frameworth. We didn't live up to that. Uh, we had to buy out a lot of the contracts. He was gracious enough to let us off the hook in a number of them. Um, and if I think if he forced us to buy out all the contracts that I had, we would have been in serious trouble. Yeah. Um, so you know, it it isn't all roses when no. we when when we were growing and learning about the industry. And I've learned so much about it. And um, the mistakes you make. I mean, a friend of mine said the, the the school of hard knocks is the best school you can learn from. And sure, we learned a lot from that. Just don't just stay within your your zone and do the channels that you. It can do. it feels like this is a it follows the same trajectory as like the story of Wolf of Wall Street. You know, without all of the illegalities, where you you just find a couple things that works, you ride that until all of a sudden it's too much to to handle. And there's a little bit of a downfall. And thankfully, uh, you are able to recover and and take the, I guess, for you, most important parts of the deals that you had and make sure that none of your clients got hurt in the process was probably pretty important to you as well. Yeah, you know, there's a very fine line between um, for an entrepreneur that has to um, do with 
to be successful in business, you have to, in, in many cases, at least in my case, you have to be aggressive. You want to be the best. You want to be the, uh, the most important. You, you don't want any deal going anywhere else that you could do. And that's how you get to, to, to the top of the food chain. Um, in, and sometimes um, there's other ways to do it, but that's the way I do sure. it. And so my aggressive nature um, is what built this company. I mean, I signed a Sidney Crosby $50,000 minimum guarantee. That was a good thing. Right. Maybe it was, some, maybe it was Alexander Digg, yeah. and that would have been a bad thing. Yep. So fortuitous comes into play. But on the other hand, you don't want the other guy getting an exclusive over you. So you maybe do a deal that you normally wouldn't do because you don't want it to go to the sure. other guy. And when you think that way, that's a big mistake. Yeah. I mean, it, it was at that time as well. It seemed like every company had come up trying to get those exclusive deals, take a risk on someone and hope that it pays off. It felt like every year, every top five, 10 draft picks was assigned to one of the, the uh, big entities out there. And I think that that was necessary for a time. You know, if you look at if you look at where the industry was back when you started in the Wild West, at least now there are more reasonable, smaller pockets of companies you go to for something you know is going to be legitimate. It's not what it used to be, though. It's not like every player has an exclusive arrangement with someone, but it feels as though they kind of play ball with a few select companies where you know you have some sort of trustworthy rapport for. So it it almost started here in, at the bottom, ended up skyrocketing, and now it's sort of oscillated and end up right there in the middle somewhere. And we're the same way. We have fewer exclusive agreements, uh, but the ones that we do, we, we take very seriously. And we also have the ability to go, you know, through some reputable sources to get in touch with uh, the players themselves. And that, that seems yeah. to work out for everyone. I don't want to be um, that guy that gets everybody, but I'll tell you what we did do is we changed the way th people think, even for companies like Upper Deck, um, Fanatics. Uh, Fanatics used to buy their autographs from us. Right. The writing was on the wall. They're that big that sooner or later they're going to approach the players, and they and for, they did. For those who who aren't aware of the trajectory that Fanatics took, uh, they started as more of if I, if I'm correct about this, they started more as the the back end web platform for companies like Mounted Memories and uh, which was in the for the NFL and and the NFL Fan Shop, and they eventually got into hockey. Uh, developed their platform to a point where they were running NHL.com and shop.nhl.com uh, and selling NFL. most of those. They, they NFL, started they, growing exponentially. I remember early on in this industry going to various memorabilia websites and recognizing the outline on a lot, like the template for a lot of these websites were the same. And if you scrolled down to the bottom, sure enough, it was powered by Mounted Memories or powered by Fanatics. And and like you say, you know, you don't stop a company that, that gets that kind of momentum from just coming into your territory and, and doing it themselves. Why would they? For most cases, money talks. So these guys, uh, Upper Deck, um, uh, um, Fanatics, and those guys, they got the deep pockets. Yeah. Um, they're still players that it's not about money. Um, believe it or not, it's not about money to Sydney. It's about relationships. Right. The same with Carey Price. And that's how we keep these guys because I don't have the money to throw at these guys. We'll do a good job and we, we max out what, what they get. But when the players are coming into the league, McDavid's a good example. Um, AJ's was another memorabilia dealer here. Uh, they they took our model and went and got uh, Connor McDavid right in the early stages. Yep. They they saw an up and coming player. They heard a lot. I was asleep at the switch, didn't know it was coming. They got him, uh, and for the first year or two, even when he was uh, down in Erie and then up here in the NHL, they had an exclusive arrangement with him. And that is, you know, they're nice guys. Drove me crazy. How did I miss that sure, one? Sure, right? sure. Um, but Connor, eventually, when the contract was due, went for the big money. Yeah. He went, he went to uh, Fanatics. Upper Deck. Uh, upper, deck upper Deck, sorry. He went to yeah. Upper Deck. Um, so for him, it was about the exposure, the where the money was. Um, uh, you know, AJ's is, is a good, solid company. They're, they're not on the level that Upper Deck is. Who is and, and Upper either, Deck is either enormous. Either yeah, yeah. So he made that choice. We are fortunate enough that with, with the players that we have, we value them. But there's always that, um, that way that the 
memorabilia dealers like ourselves are looking for that next up and coming. Of and course. So Lafreniere is the next guy. Yep. Uh, Upper Deck got him too. I was told about him, uh, but there's no guarantee. Now, he will be a great player. Will he be a McDavid or a Crosby or a, or a Gretzky? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Right now, he's not living up to that hype. He's good. He's not living but up to that hype. The fact is, though, regardless, everyone knows, agents know, a company is going to be willing to pay that kind of money before they even make the league. I mean, that kind of takes us out of the equation or, or companies of our size out of the equation unless they want that focus on a boutique, smaller company that can that can kind of benefit them. That's and exactly that's, and that's, right. Uh, it's tough. It's, it's not going to be the case with most players, I don't think. Yeah, and I'm at the age now where I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not, I'm, I'm, we have a very successful business, so I'm not going to be all worried about sure. we missed out on anybody uh, I, if I want the product from McDavid, I'll go to Upper Deck and I'll buy that product and we resell it. It's not a lot of money in it for reselling those guys. Sure, sure. But uh, if there's players, we have a great reputation. So literally, we've just signed an exclusive deal with Josh Anderson when mm -hmm. he moved to um, when he moved to Montreal. We just signed re-signed a three-year deal with Carey Price. Right. Um, these are some of the biggest names out there. Um, we just did a deal with Shea Weber. Right. Uh, so we have those players that come on board uh, out of nowhere, the thinking that I'm upper deck and all those guys are making bids for them. They stay with us or they come to us because they hear about how we treat the players, what we do for them, what we do for their families. Yeah. It's we treat them like our family uh, and they appreciate that, yeah. so we do. And that's kind of the hope. And, and you know, again, started out the Wild West, and and you kind of took it upon yourself to to change that in a way, at least for yourself, and it ends up being something that's industry-wide. You know, you talk about in the beginning not knowing who you can go to for a legitimately authentic, you know, Doug Gilmore autograph or whomever if you're not going direct to the source. And now, to bring this full circle, Matt Ellenberger's uh, Facebook group, don't they have a question if you want to enter who is the exclusive... Uh, a supplier of Sidney Crosby memorabilia, and then in brackets, all collectors should know this, and the answer is Frameworth. You know what? That was one of the nicest things I ever read. <laughs> I went I went to join that group, and it just kind of made me understand that, you know, I just still consider us a picture frame company that deals with players. We're so fortunate. But I didn't realize the level that we're on and the respect that we have in the industry. So when I went to join that Facebook page, and it was all about Sidney Crosby memorabilia. And to get into the group, you have to add, answer some uh, two or three questions just to make sure that you're legitimate. Yeah. And the, and that one question was, uh, who's the exclusive dealer for Sidney one. Crosby? So I'm giving you guys all the answer if you want to <laughs> join the group. It's Frameworth. But... Um, but to see that, that was pretty cool. That's great. And you brought it full circle. Uh, that is about our time, but I loved that journey. That is a, it is a picture perfect story of uh, having some fortuitous luck, maybe taking it a little bit too far and then landing right where you want to be. Uh, Dad, thanks again for sharing everything. Anything Thank you, you want to say before we sign off? No, I think we've got, uh, we would love you guys to uh, tell your friends about it and let's join the group. The bigger the fan base, the more we can do for you. We've got some great guests coming up. Uh, I've got a whole list of guys that we've dealt with over the past. I just heard from Gary Roberts. I'm trying to get him on here. A lot of these guys come here to do some framing, so I hit them up when they're here. So it's <laughs> Benefit. Uh, yeah, so you can hear all of our social media handles to come join the community. Also, if you have any questions, make sure to send us an email at signoffpod at framework.com. We're going to start addressing some of the uh, the viewer mail that we get, and if they have any questions for you, Dad, uh, they can definitely send those along as well for some insight that maybe they wouldn't have known otherwise. Yeah, but happy to uh, answer anybody. Awesome. Uh, so uh, on behalf of myself, Mikey Aaronworth, and Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth, uh, this is us signing off. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we made it to the end of yet another episode. Thanks again so much for joining us. You can find videos of all of our episodes on YouTube by searching the Sign Off Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Frameworth Sport or Instagram at Frameworth Sports. And hey, if you're not sick of me yet, you can find me on Twitter over at, at Retrograde Mikey, or you can always find me embarrassing myself over on Instagram at Aaronworth. The Sign Off is a proud product of Fadu Productions and Sad Styles Productions, executive producers Mikey Aaronworth and Andrew Bascom. Until next week, this is Mikey Aaronworth, signing off. Furnished by Sad Styles Productions. Get into it!